Tom Curran's Patriots Talk Podcast is presented by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more. As far as Mr. Jones is concerned, it's, it's the social media and the media who have turned him into a thug, who have labeled him a thug with no evidence whatsoever. This is not a situation where Mr. Jones ever wanted to be a thug or thought of as a thug. But because he's a young black man, all of a sudden he's a thug. There's no indication whatsoever that he was in any way disrespectful. There's no inf information at all that he was in any way did anything to say he wanted to be a gang member or a thug. He's a young black man charged with a crime. Therefore, he must want to be a gang member. He must want to be a thug. That label that was attached to him through social media almost got him fired, and it was completely unfounded. Mr. Jones did exactly what anyone else in his situation would have done. They, he, he cooperated with the police. He, he, he was arrested. He promised to be here. He showed up here this morning. Um, he was polite to the police. He did nothing that, that, would, uh, that would suggest that he was in any way trying to act as a thug or wanted uh, or want to be a gang member. That's made up from, from social media, and that needs to stop. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome into Tom Curran's Patriots Talk Podcast. I'm Tom Curran. That's Phil Perry. We're going to talk a little bit about the Jack Jones situation today. You heard his attorney, Rosemary Scarpaccio, on the sidewalk outside of the courthouse, explaining that Jack Jones was almost fired. So apart from the charges, Phil, apart from guilt or innocence or any of that, how do the Patriots proceed from here? Would they be in a position where they're going to wait this out, do you think? Gather information, keep them on the team until something's rendered? What would you do? I think the decision's already been made. I think if they wanted to make sure that they were no longer connected to anyone that was connected to guns in any way, shape, or form, they would have made the decision on Friday when the news came down. It's my understanding there was a little get-together uh, for the coaches and maybe some family members right around the time that this was happening. So I, I, it would have been really interesting to see the team reaction in the moment when Bill Belichick gets that call, if he's there mm. at, a, at sort of a, you know, say goodbye for summer sort of gathering for everybody on the staff, but they would have made the call right then and there. Okay, well, we can't have this. I think they've made the decision. We're going to try to find all the information we can as this process plays out. And then when we need to make a decision, We'll make one. What's interesting now, Tom, is though they have to make sure that he's that they feel comfortable with him still representing their team between now and August 18th, mm -hmm. because that's when he's due back in court. And I, I'm going to make a prediction, and that is that he will not be on the field when training camp begins, which is going to hamstring the football team to not have one of your projected starting cornerbacks out there, but. I think that's the difficult part. I, I would imagine he could be on, you know, an NFI list, non-football injury or just not suspended, but just kind of in a limbo. I could be completely wrong. And the Patriots could say, well, we're reserving judgment until the ruling comes down. But I just think to have that charge hanging over you, unless he's got the most plausible explanation, or you can find somehow the person who devilishly planted these guns there on them at the last second. They should be tirelessly looking for that person, by the way. Then I think the Patriots would be in a position where Robert Kraft might feel as if to say, we have to do something. We're not just going to trot him out there day after day to go cover passes as if nothing happened. Something happened. We have to show that we react to a charge like this, this kind of carelessness surrounding guns in our football team. I wonder, Phil, do you think intent enters into this like i don't know whether like can you just say oops i forgot or i had no idea i mean does does that float when you go to like if somebody jammed something in yours as it was sitting on the sidewalk after you went back to your trunk and you walked in and put it in security and you had no idea can't you just say i, I just didn't know not mine well so after having spoken to a couple of criminal defense attorneys. Um, my understanding is that might float if the gun's legal, you've got the proper licensing to carry the gun or to own the gun in the first place, and if you have a clean record. And if, if those things are met, for the most part, they may actually be willing to say to you, okay, 
as they did with Quinn and Williams from the Jets a few years ago. This was back in 2020. He showed up to the airport with an unloaded gun in his bag and went to the Delta check-in counter and told them that. Now, the gun was legal. He didn't have Wait, a need. He told them? He told them. He said, hey, I, got, I just want to let you know I have a gun in my bag. Why did he do that? Well, because I he think he was, he was um, aware of the fact that he hadn't stored it properly and that it was oh. sort of like, a, I forgot. Hey, sorry, there's a gun in there, just so you know. That's, that's my understanding okay. of that particular situation. Now, that was, uh, he had the proper licensing for, I believe, the state of Alabama, but not the state of New York. And we know the state of New York is very, you know, very strict gun laws as well, like Massachusetts here. But he got out of that by basically paying a fine because clean record, legal gun somewhere. It was, you know, in Alabama, legal. Um, but they were willing to just let him off with a fine there. In this situation, it's very different. First of all, it's two guns. They're both loaded. You've got these large capacity feeding devices and he's charged with unlawful possession. So I don't know if that means he's not a licensed gun owner or if these guns aren't properly registered themselves. I don't know the specifics of that, but it seems like you add in the Panda Express incident for, incident for Jack Jones and he might be 0 for 3 in these situations when it comes to proper paperwork, legal gun, clean record. And that's, I think, going to hurt him. And I do think uh, I saw in the police report that Andrew Callahan from the Herald um, was able to obtain from the state police who are at Logan that I think he acknowledged that he's not a Massachusetts uh, licensed carrier in Massachusetts. So, I mean, he still could have someplace else, but certainly not in Massachusetts. Phil, if you're Jack Jones and you have an attorney who'll stand on the sidewalk for you and defend you in such strident terms, there's clearly some kind of a, at least plausible explanation in your pocket that you're going to provide. And, you know, you're going to pound the table and say, he had no idea. This was not his intent. He's just here to play football. So then the question becomes for the judge and a jury, if it comes to that, well, how'd they get there? So someone, I mean, you, you're going to have to produce the person who planted them. And you're also going to have to, since there's serial numbers on the guns, my guess is, Mr. Forensics watched a little too much television, you're going to have to explain where the guns came from. Were they purchased? Whose possession were they in? Were they stolen? Were they even listed as stolen? I mean, how did he come into possession of those guns? Because you do see on the police report that the guns themselves, all the serial numbers for the Glocks are um, contained there. So they'll trace that and figure out, well, how do they come to this guy who doesn't have the right to carry a gun in mass. I wonder, I wonder if part of the defense, you, you know, I'm, I'm with you. I would think that he's going to need to have some sort of plausible explanation, you know, not just for the team <laughs> that's, that's sticking by him at least at this point, but also when they go to trial, but is, is that necessary? Is my, is my question. Does he only need to prove that there is a there is reasonable doubt as to whether they're his guns or he put them in the bag or you know what I'm saying? And, may, and maybe mm -hmm. the, the the word reasonable is the operative word there because, dude, they were in your bag. You carried them to the you know, are we sure that you put them in there, that you were the only one who ever saw that bag? And was there somebody at your house who earlier in that day who might have put them in there and you had no idea? I guess maybe, but now we're getting into unreasonable sorts of scenarios that we're drawing up here. And that's I, what, what I think Rosemary, Rosemary Scapaccio, Scapiccio's, um, I, just, I just find whatever her defense will be to be fascinating because right now uh, it feels like sort of an open and shut situation. In Jack Jones' defense, and I think we all knew this in our heart of hearts Friday night, there's not a person on the planet, or at least in the United States, upright with opposable thumbs with a working brain who doesn't know you can't bring guns through security. So all the people who were saying, well, how could he be so stupid as to try and bring guns? On? He wasn't trying to. You know, I know, we all know he was not trying to bring those guns on the plane. So really the question as it pertains to, right? 
I mean, that's, that's a given. I would, I would assume so. But if, yes, if we're, if we're working under that assumption that a guy who is smart enough to be able to uh, find his way onto a football field and align himself properly and, and intercept Aaron Rodgers at, at, you know what I mean? Like that requires a certain level of competency. Then yes, I think we can assume yeah. that he wasn't I mean, trying to bring loaded guns onto a plane. There was no, I didn't know that. Right. It's, it's not like you got, the, Hey, Oh, I didn't know that. I mean, so you weren't, he knows he wasn't supposed to have them. So working off of that assumption, I wonder if the Patriots look at this situation from the optics of it or from the personal standpoint of it. Look, he's been a good player for us. We got crossways, but as I said, Bill Belichick would be saying at the uh, owners' meetings, we, we fixed things where everything's good now is what he said about the relationship with Jack Jones after the suspension. And we're invested in him. And he's not a bad kid. Does that enter into it, I wonder? Or is it more of, look, we got to have some zero tolerance here too. He's been given this leeway. It was something Ted Johnson was talking about last night. They've invested a lot in the kid. Um, and he's a good player. So I wonder how much the, what's in his heart, how's he operate on a day-to-day in the team factor into this? It must to a degree, but I would say based on how last year ended for him, I'm not sure how much I know trust he could have built up. And, you know, at the very least, you're dealing with some maturity issues and now guns are involved. You know, again, I just I look at this span of the next two months. You, you've got to be pretty confident that nothing's going to happen with this guy in terms of being a, a good citizen mm-hmm. between now and the time where you can actually get him into the facility and you can, you know, for back, lack of a better term, keep an eye on him. You know, right now it's the off season. These guys are to the wind. They're, you know, you're really not even allowed to to be um, around coaches all that much. You can go to the facility, you can work out, you can't do anything football related there. Anyway, it's uh, it's it's requiring a certain level of trust that I'm not sure how the Patriots could be at that point with this particular individual, given everything that they know he came to the league with, and given how last year ended, uh, they must feel like he's worth it. And listen, he's a starting level corner, Tom, on a fourth round pick salary. And, you know, there's a lot of value there. And if you're doing what's best for the football team, you might want to try to ride this out because what's best for the football team in terms of on the field, not in terms of the brand or anything like that, but in terms Mm -hmm. of on the field is making this, making sure uh, this guy can play for you. Download the new NBC Sports Boston app, okay? It has the latest news, analysis, commentary, and insight from the network's stable of experts and insiders, including Phil Perry, Chris Forsberg, John Tomasi, and me, Tom Curran. You can also listen to podcasts, follow live scores and stats, highlights, watch behind-the-scenes content, and interviews. Really easy to negotiate on your phone. So go ahead and download the NBC Sports Boston app now in the App Store and on Google Play. Find the link in the show notes. It feels to me as if the ironclad control that Bill Belichick has had over this team for so long is is a little bit slipping. Um, Between even last year with Jack Jones and Jake Bailey both having to be suspended because of differences over how they were supposed to practice, things they were supposed to do, um, with Trent Brown showing up in a state that didn't allow him to even participate and showing up late at that with Lawrence Guy holding out with this situation now. It feels as if, wouldn't say that they're not taking Bill as seriously, but maybe that they're not taking Bill as seriously. They're just not, I think maybe you're more afraid of losing your job or position on a team that's better and can do without you and still win then maybe if you think your team, hey, what are they going to do, fire me? They need me. That's an interesting point. And, and I think, you know, my, my take the other night on early edition was similar but different. Working off the same theory that they need as much talent as they can get. And that has impacted them in the draft. And this is a player that I think in the years between, say, 2014 and 2020, they wouldn't have had much interest in. I think there was a real period of time where post Hernandez, they were looking for, they were looking for a certain type of individual. You, you know, they, mm-hmm. they wanted the, they wanted the boy scout. I think. Well, <laughs> your team captain. Yep. 
And now, you know, so you do that and you, and you have a few dry drafts consecutively that have really hurt your team in terms of the on the field product. And by the time the 2022 draft comes around or 2021, you know, there are a lot of people that didn't want to draft Christian Barmore. They drafted Christian Barmore in the second round. You know, would they have been willing to do that a few years earlier? I'm not saying he's got any kind of, you know, violent record or weapons or anything, but like there, there's a certain kind of risk with Barmore that other teams weren't willing to take before the Patriots in that year's draft. They draft him the next year in the fourth round. They take Jack Jones. Would they have taken Jack Jones coming off a burglary charge mm -hmm. in 2014? I kind of doubt it, but they needed talent and they were willing to that whole, you know, the risk reward thing, the risk assessment that's involved in every single draft. I think they felt like they needed, you know, there's a talented player staring them at the face. It's staring them in the face and they need as many talented draft picks as possible. Let's go get them. It is interesting when you talk about the, allowances they would make from 2014 to 2020 you remember second round pick jordan richards oh i mean his the biggest selling point on him was he was such a nice guy great smile Bill. Great big smile. smile you're gonna love his smile you're gonna love talking to him he was not fun to talk to but not good either um but <laughs> that's what they were content to bring in okay this guy we got a great team we got tom brady we got gronk we got edelman we got dante we have uh matt patricia josh mcdaniels we got a great coaching staff we can have nice guys and they're going to get drafted along by everybody else. Now the team's worse and you have to go, that guy's not good enough to help us. Let's get that player. I mean, it's, it's funny when you, again, you look at the second round picks and I'm literally forgetting the name of the cornerback from Juwan Williams, the guys that you took just on a lark. And now you're taking fourth round gambles for players who turn into your starters a couple of years later because the whole tenor of the team has so drastically shifted. I wonder if you're looking at, if Bill's looking at this, and like how much do these guys expect me to put up with? I look at Trent Brown and Bill Belichick, I'm like this is blatant disrespect to me, to the team, to Adrian Clem, to the ownership. You look at the Jack Jones situation and while he may have had them planted on him, he's going to look at that and say, if, if there's anybody on the team who has to make sure that his luggage is tidy before he goes, it would be Jack, I think. And this is, you know, even Mac Jones going outside the building last year. It's just a front after a front. <laughs> At some point, Bill has to put his foot down, um, I would think. Or you just swallow hard and say, we're going forward, trying to win football games. Do you think this is at all related to just the, the kind of coach that I think Bill is trying to become, which is a little bit more lenient based on the types of people that are coming to him from the college ranks. You know, it's, I think it's hard as a, as a pro coach now to put, put your foot down in any regard, <laughs> you know, cause kids these days, you know, young yeah. athletes these days, I don't think respond to that the way that they may have in other years. So there's, there's part of Bill Belichick that I think looks at whether it's conditioning, hitting in training camp or dealing with, you know, I don't know what you call them, behavioral issues or, um, I don't know, minor dust-ups, you know, what, just when it comes to your relationships with certain players, do you just have to become more lenient across the board, Tom? Yeah. And, ju and just say, this is kind of how I have to be now. I can't be 2001 Bill Belichick anymore. Yeah, I think in one respect, yes. But maybe you have to be more proactive at the outset with these guys and on them. So the communication is constant. And I don't know if Bill is the greatest communicator on the everyday, like, you know, checking, checking, checking. Where you at? How you feeling? How's it going? What are you at? What are you, at? What are you feeling? How you doing? How you doing? You staying away from those guys? Staying with these guys? Good. I will say this about generationally. Being 55 and being from the previous generation, generally speaking, say general one more time. Um, I think kids are better behaved now than they were. 25 or 30 years ago. I really do. I think that the there's less chance of barroom fights than there was 25 or 30 years ago. There's less mayhem. There's probably less drunkenness. These guys are in unbelievable shape by and large. And I've always said this, the Patriots, when you deal with the Patriots, you're dealing with 85 to 90% of guys who are really good guys. People who I look at and say, wish I was out on the ball. Like I'm just throwing Adrian Phillips, Kyle Duggar, uh, you know, 
Jonathan Jones, I'm just stick it in the secondary, Marcus Jones, all these guys I've talked to, and they're just so impressive. And I don't know if that was the case when I started covering the team in 97, 98, 99. There were a lot more, you know, dinks. And a lot more people who had propensity to do shit. So, and they did. But I do think the, the need to be more proactive in your communication and on this stuff is important. And I think the size of your staff is important. I think the Patriots have a small staff. And I don't know if they're great communicators. You're quiet guys. Steve. Ryan Belichick on defense, quieter, quieter fellers. Uh, it's, it's a thing. It's a thing. Do you think the players will feel as if Jack Jones is being allowed to twist in the wind if the Patriots make no statement? Do you think they're closely watching what Bill does and rendering a decision um, as to how they'll feel about it? Or do you think they're disgusted with Jack Jones? I think they probably for the most part, look at it the way we do, which is how, how could you allow that to happen? Right. How could you get yourself into that spot? So I don't think they're looking for a statement. I do wonder uh, if how they handle him once they're back to work would impact any of the guys. Hey, this guy hasn't been convicted yet. He hasn't even been to, to try. All we know is he's been, he's been charged, but he can't work now. I know. Okay. We haven't released him yet, but we're not letting him practice. Is he on the team or is he not? Yeah, you're right. You know, there, there might be some, there might be sort of a hazy, a haziness to his situation and his employment. Um, but I, so maybe I, I walk, I'm going to walk back my prediction then. Go ahead. I'm going to walk back my prediction on the suspension then with a list. Maybe he will be on the field. I'm going to walk back that prediction. I, I wonder if he'd be on the field and it like, obviously, you know, we're not going to be able to talk to him. Right. But, <laughs> but I, I, I don't know. I don't think it would surprise me if he was out there and playing, you know, until, until we find out for sure what his, uh, what his future holds. I hope it works out for the kid. I mean, as stupid and as moronic as it is, I haven't spoken to him enough to really have a, an opinion as to, Hey, I like him. He's a nice kid or not. And really what difference does that make? But he's 25. And on one hand you say, ah, it's kind of an old player. It's still 25. It's, you know, you got a long way ahead of you to straighten things out and stay away from stupid, stupid situations. So, and of course the football team will be better with him out there than not out there. I don't even really feel like getting into the football. Everybody knows this by now. We've talked about it enough. I I enjoyed talking to him. We we had an interview with him on um, next paths and Part of the reason I enjoyed talking with him was because he's, he was pretty unfiltered, you know, the way he was at the podium after that interception of Aaron Rodgers. You know, he just kind of let it fly in a way that, especially young players in that locker room, almost never do. Um, so hopefully it works out for him, too. I just don't know what his, what his odds are. You know, it feels like you've got to come up with something. You've got to get a jury, I guess, to believe that you were framed. Or, you know, somebody, came I mean, that's, your, the, you got to come to that. your house with guns that aren't yours and put them in your bag and, you know, put it in your sock bag, essentially. And you brought us to the airport. I mean, I can't, I don't have any idea. I've never held a clock, but I can't imagine the two of them are that light. Especially feels, when you've got them loaded. Well, kind of heavy. I mean, if it's otherwise just socks and underwear, how do you not notice? Well, and I believe in the police report, they were in a, they were in a box as well, right? An unlocked case of some sort. It said UFC on it. So the, that was the bag. So unlawful firearm that. carrier. They visited. They visited the UFC last summer during uh, their trip out to Vegas. So I'm wondering if he got a bag there, and that that was uh, that's what he's been using. But yeah, no, it sounded like in the police report that they were they were stowed in a box of some sort. So between the box, the guns, and the ammunition, like there would be a heft to that that you would think would be hard to ignore. Yeah. Wow, I feel strong today. No, I feel weak today. All right, Phil. Uh, listen, thanks, buddy. See you later in the week. Uh, okay. This was an emergency pod, folks. So we're probably not going to do a lot between now and training camp. But with things happening, if there's a DeAndre Hopkins, you know we'll be here. So talk to you soon, Phil. Talk to you soon, everybody. Goodbye. Bye.